Hi everyone, this is Tamika. I'm so excited to have you here and to be chatting about one of my favorite topics, which is hormonal health and periods. Now I'm sure you're here for a whole range of different reasons. You've got a lot of different symptoms going on that you want to get to the bottom of, but I know that regardless of the reason you're here, you're going to leave here today with some really actionable tips that you can start implementing straight away to make some real change to your health and your hormones. So I thought I might start today by sharing a little bit of my own personal experience with hormones. Um, so my story is probably a pretty typical story of you know going through lots of different forms of birth control, really not reacting well to any of them and just feeling like there had to be a better way to manage my hormones and my contraception. Um, when I finally took the plunge and stopped using oral contraception about five years ago, unfortunately my acne from my teenage years came back, uh, my periods were super irregular, super painful and my hormones were just all over the shop. My moods were up and down and I had no idea what was going on. Um, alongside that I had a whole bunch of different digestive issues happening which uh, were causing me a lot of distress. So long story short, I had to go through a really big holistic um, healthcare program to address the root cause of what was going on with my body. But after a number of years, I've managed to really get on top of everything that's been going on. And it's now such a strong passion of mine to work with other women who are going through the same things because I know that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this hard. You should not have to be suffering for your periods every month. And there's so much much we can do with natural medicine, diet, lifestyle and supplements to bring you back into balance and I'm here to show you how. Okay, so let's start by talking about what a normal period looks like. It's super important to understand what a normal period is because a lot of the time we don't have much to compare. Um, you know, we're not really very aware of what other people are experiencing and we've only got our past experiences to compare to. So let's jump right into what a normal period looks like. So your menstrual cycle is nicknamed a period because it occurs periodically on a monthly basis. And that's because it takes around about 28 days for some pretty important events to occur in your ovaries. So on average, you've got about two weeks in the first half of your cycle um, whilst your egg is growing and then two weeks in the second half of the cycle once your egg has been released up until the point where you're bleeding again. And that period is roughly 28 days. Now the really, really important thing to understand is that's the textbook 28 day cycle. Actually, on average, only 14% of women have a 28-day cycle. So what's normal is anywhere between 21 and 35 days. So what's much more important um, when you're thinking about whether or not you have a regular cycle is not whether or not you actually meet this you know, typical 28-day cycle, but how much variation there is between your previous cycles. So you may be a woman who has a 22 day cycle and that may, that may be completely normal for you. You know, you might be right up to 35 days and having that fairly regularly, you know, plus or minus a couple of days. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's an issue. So I see a lot of women in clinic who are like, oh, you know, my period's late this month. And what they mean is my period didn't come at 28 days, but it was actually perfectly on time for whatever was going on in that person's body in that month. So there's a lot of different influences on the length of your cycle, um, which can be perfectly harmless as well. And we'll get into that a little bit later in this presentation. So we've talked about the normal. And then the important thing to understand is that ovulation, no matter where it happens in the cycle, is always followed by a period bleed 10 to 16 days later. So anytime you're having a true period, and we'll talk a bit about what that means later about the difference between being on the pill and having a real period, but anytime you're bleeding, it means that you have ovulated 10 to 16 days earlier. So whether or not the first half of your cycle is you know five days or 50 days, your period is always going to be that part that stays more regular in the second half of the cycle. Um, a really, really important point to understand is your cycle is a key indicator of your overall health. So what I mean by that is when there's something a bit out of balance in the rest of your body, one of the first places that that often shows up is in your menstrual cycle. Okay, let's have a look at what might look like a little bit of a scary diagram, but don't worry, I'm going to talk you through it. So basically what we're looking at here is the fluctuations of your hormone levels throughout your menstrual cycle. So looking down the bottom at that colorful graph, what you can see is you've got on the far left, you've got day zero. So that's the day of your bleed. So the first day your period starts and you can see it goes right across up to day 28, which is that average uh, cycle length we talked about. And that's when you'd be getting another bleed. 
So we're going to talk about the normal sequence of events that happens throughout our menstrual cycle so that you can kind of get a bit of an understanding of what these hormones are really responsible for and then we'll dive deeper into what can happen when they become imbalanced. So the first hormone that I want you to focus on is the, that sort of green color, which is FSH, which is your follicle stimulating hormone. And that does exactly what it sounds like. It stimulates your follicles to grow. Now your follicles are where you're growing an egg, which is then ultimately released at ovulation. So you can see right at the beginning of your cycle, all your hormone levels are pretty low. You've got a little bit of that FSH picking up and what that's doing is it's stimulating a couple of these little follicles to start to grow and to become slightly bigger follicles as they go in the race to become the one that's released as the egg at ovulation. So you can see alongside that as that's starting to pick up a little bit, you've also got your estrogen, which is still pink hormone there. You can see that's kind of going along quite flat and then sort of around day seven, it suddenly takes this big spike. And what's happening there is your follicles, which have that egg inside, are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they grow bigger, they start to release estrogen. So this is the first half of the menstrual cycle where we're producing all of our estrogen. Um, so you can see that that reaches this really big spike. And just after that, you've got a spike in the brown colored hormone, which is something called LH. So that's luteinizing hormone. Now what that's responsible for is triggering that follicle, which is housing that nice little egg inside to explode open and release the egg. That is what ovulation is. So you can see that round about in the middle of the cycle, you know, roughly on day 14, you've got that um, follicle growing nice and big. You've got the egg, you can see actually above it in that little diagram in the middle of the diagram there, you've got the egg exploding out. Um, and then you can see that your estrogen and your LH and your FSH all drop right off after ovulation. But then what we notice, and this is really, really key for cycle health, is after that you can see that your progesterone, which is there in the yellow, which has been low all the first half of the cycle, it's now starting to pick up and build a nice sort of peak there and then drop off slowly for the rest of the cycle. Now the reason that we make progesterone is because as you can see in that middle section of the diagram there, you've got your blue follicle, which is exploded with the egg, and then you can see something called the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum is actually a little gland that forms from where the egg was growing. So once the egg has exploded out, that little sac which was growing the egg in it actually turns into a gland and it starts secreting our hormone progesterone. Now progesterone is one of the most important um, hormones for the menstrual cycle and we'll get into right into why that's so important. But you can see that we need to have our ovulation taking place for us to produce the, to, the progesterone. And then you can see, you know, if the egg is not fertilized, which is what's happened in this cycle, you then have this sort of steady decline down of all the hormones and then around, you know, roughly day 28, you're going to have another bleed and then that whole process um, starts again. So that's kind of a really, you know, brief overview of what's happening hormone wise. But what I also want to draw your attention to here is up the top, you can see your body temperature. So you can see that in the first half of the cycle, it's pretty steady and it's pretty low. Then you can see that once you ovulate, you actually get this spike in temperature and you can actually see that that maintains that heat for the rest of your cycle. Now, the reason for this is probably guessed progesterone. So progesterone, as its name suggests, progestation, its entire role is to keep a pregnancy alive if that is what happens, if your egg does get fertilized. Um, and so one of the functions that it has is it actually warms up your whole body. And the reason for this is because if you did have a fertilized egg inside your uterus, it wants to keep that as a really nice nourishing environment for that egg. Um, you know, a lot of the time, obviously, we're not trying to get pregnant, but this is a key indicator that we can be paying attention to, which lets us know whether or not you actually are ovulating and how much progesterone you're making, if we can sort of see that spike. So, you know, taking your temperature in the, morning, in the morning is a good way to actually be tracking whether or not this is happening for you. Okay, so we've talked through the sort of hormonal cascade that happens throughout your entire cycle, but now let's focus in on the actual bleed, so your period. So a normal bleed is anywhere between two to seven days, and you're looking at on average around 50 mils of blood loss. So that's around two and a half tablespoons. Uh, a lot of women are actually really surprised that that's all, all the blood loss is over that time. Um, and so, you know, the average is 50 mils, but really a healthy range is anywhere between 20 to 80 mils. Now, obviously, if you're not kind of calculating this, it can be really hard to figure out whether or not you have a normal flow. 
So a little exercise that I like to do with some of my clients is to get them to estimate for sort of one or two cycles just to see where they're at. So they can get a bit of an idea of how they fall within that range. So the way that you can do this is, you know, if you're using um, pads then or, or tampons, one regular soaked tampon or pad, you're looking at about five mils. Um, if you're using a super tampon, that's about 10 mils, so about double. Um, obviously, if you're using a menstrual cup, it's a lot easier because every time you're taking the cup out, it's got that little mill measurement on the side. And what you want to be doing is just for the entire length of your bleed, every time you're changing a pad, tampon, a cup, whatever you're using, you want to just be noting that down. And at the end of that period, you can just be calculating it all up to see where you fall within this range. All right, let's meet the key hormone players in women's health. So firstly, we've got estradiol. So estradiol is the most dominant form of estrogen that's produced throughout our childbearing um, years. And estradiol is a really, really important hormone. We sort of think of it as our happy hormone. So, you know, it's increasing our production of neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is our feel-good happy hormone, dopamine, which is, you know, our motivation, pleasure, wanting to go out and do things, get things done. Um, it also stimulates the libido. It's really important for our bones, our heart, muscles, sleep, skin, and metabolism. A lot of things. Um, and then the other really important function in terms of the menstrual cycle is it stimulates that uterine growth and thickening. So this is a good thing. This is how we build the lining, you know, nourish that lining in case our egg does get fertilized. But also it means that in cases where you've got an increased production of estrogen or more estrogen floating around that's not being broken down, which we'll talk about in a minute, this means that that lining gets really, really thick. So the thicker that lining is, the heavier your period is going to be because ultimately you're going to have to shed that lining once your period comes. Um, so that's something we'll kind of get into in a minute. Um, but the other function of estradiol is it stimulates fertile mucus production. So this is that mucus that you can see sort of leading up to ovulation, which really is a key indicator of ovulation and overall cycle health. So what you may be noticing is around those days leading up to ovulation as your, in, your estrogen is spiking you know on the graph we saw that big increase in that red um, estrogen there you're going to be noticing more sort of moist sticky wet sensations down there and that's a pretty good indication that your estrogen is rising nicely as that egg is growing okay so our second hormone is progesterone and as i touched on before this is one of my favorite hormones for period health Unfortunately, we do see it low in a lot of women, so working on making sure we're producing enough of this hormone is really, really key. Now, like I touched on before, its, it's biggest job is to sustain pregnancy, so progestation. Um, but it's also really, really key because it counterbalances estrogen. So whilst estrogen is building up that nice lining in your uterus, um, in the second half of the cycle, progesterone is thinning it down. So it's maintaining that lining, but it's making sure it doesn't keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. So that's why in conditions where we've got an excess of estrogen to progesterone ratio, you can see that that lining is just growing unopposed. So it doesn't have that progesterone to kind of halt it at where it needs to be. Um, like we touched on before, progesterone is responsible for that rise in body temperature that we see in the second half of the cycle. And this is actually a really key point because a lot of women that I see in clinics say to me, oh, I just, you know, I overeat so much before my period. I don't know why I can't stop eating and I've got all these cravings. And actually the reality is in the second half of your cycle, you genuinely need a little bit more food. Not massive amounts, but your body temperature is actually higher, which means you're burning through food faster. So if you're feeling like you need to eat more in the second half of your cycle, you probably do. Listen to that. Don't beat your body up. That's really, really important. Your body's trying to communicate something with you there. So stop battling that. Know that that's a normal part of your cycle. Um, progesterone is also really important because it reduces inflammation in the body. It helps us build muscles. It promotes restful sleep. It protects us against heart disease. And the most important thing that it does, in my opinion, is it really helps to calm the nervous system. So it's kind of like our natural anti-anxiety hormone. So you'll often notice in the first half of the cycle when we're more estrogen dominant, you know, we're kind of go, 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 we're getting lots of projects done, we're feeling really great. And then in the second half of the cycle, it's this sort of calming effect. So we feel like we can kind of deal with stress better and things start to slow down a little bit. That's really important that we have that balance in those two phases of our cycle. Okay, next we have testosterone. And whilst this is sort of traditionally thought of as a male hormone, it is actually really, really important for women as well. 
So it's important for um, our libidos. It's also important for motivation. It really supports our mood, our energy, and our muscle building. But testosterone is one of those hormones that we really want to keep in balance. There's a lot of things that can come up when you've got an increase of testosterone, and we will touch on that in a minute. Next, we've got insulin. So insulin is that hormone that you've probably heard of before, which is responsible for taking the glucose, so the sugar in our blood, and putting that into the cells where that needs to be. So if you've got too much of this glucose running around the body, it can cause all kinds of damage in our system. So the main role of insulin is to make sure that we take that sugar out, we put it into storage, or we use it for energy production. Um, so obviously because of that, uh, one of its key roles is to stabilize blood sugar levels. It's also you know, a key hormone in terms of energy production and distribution because of that moving of the glucose around the body and therefore it affects our metabolism. Okay, so we've touched on the few key hormones for the female cycle, but now let's jump right into what actually happens when these hormones become imbalanced and what sorts of signs and symptoms can we be looking for that this might be going on in your body. So we've had a look at some of the key hormones throughout our menstrual cycle, but now let's look at what happens when these become imbalanced and some of the symptoms that might show up that this is happening in your body. Now before we jump into this, what I really want you to understand is symptoms are signs that your body is using to communicate something with you. So when something is a little bit out of balance in your body, like we talked about, it's going to show up first in your menstrual cycle. So I know that sometimes it can feel like your body is working against you and believe me, I have been there, but your body is never working against you it is just trying to communicate a message to you that something is out of balance so what I really want you to start thinking about is rather than trying to mask these symptoms that you're having with band-aid solutions let's get right into the root cause of what's actually driving this symptom in the first place so that we can address that root cause and actually make it go away for good okay so one of the first common imbalances that I see is estradiol excess or estrogen excess now, what's really important to understand here is it's not always a matter of just having too much estrogen being produced, but it's about that delicate ratio that we talked about before between estrogen and progesterone. So we want these two to be perfectly in balance with each other because like I mentioned, they counterbalance each other. So in the case where you've got too little progesterone being produced, you can have symptoms of having higher estrogen simply because these are out of balance, not because you necessarily have higher estrogen. Having higher estrogen is also something that can happen. So when you've got this estradiol excess or just more estrogen than progesterone floating around, what you're going to notice is heavy painful periods. So like we discussed before, estrogen helps to build that lining of the uterus which you then shed in your periods. So if you've got this unopposed estrogen throughout the entirety of your menstrual cycle, you're going to get that lining thicker and thicker and thicker which then means when it sheds it's going to be very very heavy. Another really common sign of having that higher estrogen is really sore, painful breasts, particularly in the lead up to your period. Another common sign is PMS, so that's premenstrual syndrome. So things like mood changes, bloating, fluid retention, um, having a short fuse, pain, um, acne, all these sorts of things that appear in the last few days before your period can be a sign of that estrogen not being sort of cleared properly, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, and then another common sign is weight retention, particularly around the thighs and hips. So estrogen tends to kind of predispose the weight to go to that area. Now, the two most common causes of why you're going to have higher estrogen is one, higher production from the ovaries. So just overall, you're producing more. But more common, what I see is poor metabolism and detoxification of the estrogen. So what's happening here is you're not actually producing too much, but your body is struggling to break down that estrogen, which means it's then circulating around your body, having that effect on your tissues again. The next uh, common hormonal imbalance is low estradiol. So with low estradiol, you're seeing things like low libido, your period might be missing or you've just got a really, really long cycle so you may only be bleeding once every few months. Um, and this is really a picture of depletion. So when we look at the common causes, a lot of these are really related to each other. So one of the most common causes for low estradiol is under eating. And the reason for this is because your body does not know the difference between being in a famine and you choosing to go on a weight loss diet. 
So your body is perceiving that as a massive threat to your survival. It's going, well, I don't know when the next time I'm going to get food, access to food is, so therefore I'm going to shut down my production of estrogen, shut down my ovulation in order to preserve my survival. Your body does not want to ovulate and have the chance of bringing a baby into the world if you're struggling just to keep yourself alive. Um, the second one is you know, very related to that and that's over-exercising. So again, our body doesn't know the difference between you choosing to get up at 5am to go to that hit class um, and then racing around all day trying to get all your jobs done versus being chased by a tiger. So when you're overexerting your body, it's perceiving this as a stress. So again, it's going to go into that survival mechanism where it's shutting down hormone production and really prioritizing your survival. Um, number three is stress. So you know, that can be from under eating, overexercising, or it could just be psychological stress. So just that feeling like you're constantly rushing, you're constantly trying to get things done, you're never achieving everything in your to-do list. That again is perceived as a stress to your body. Um, and number four is smoking, which actually has a similar effect of stress and inflammation on the body. The next really common hormonal imbalance is low progesterone. So when you've got low progesterone, that means in that second half of your cycle, like we talked about, you're just not producing enough of that progesterone or you're not ovulating and having that nice production from the corpus luteum. So when you have low progesterone, again, you're going to see symptoms of PMS because of course, when you've got low progesterone, you're also going to be exhibiting higher estrogen because of that balance. Um, another really common sign of low progesterone is spotting before your period starts. So that's where, you know, you might have um, one to three days of just sort of a couple little spots here and there. You might just be needing to put a liner on, but you're definitely not bleeding. Um, and then after a couple of days of that, your period might fully start. That can be a sign that your progesterone is low because... Like we discussed, one of the roles of progesterone is maintaining that uterine lining. So if your production is a little bit too low or it's dropping off a little bit too early, it's kind of not holding on to that lining nice and tight. So what's happening there is little bits of your lining are starting to break away before the full period is starting. Um, and we touched upon before how progesterone is so important as our natural anti-anxiety, you know, our combating stress hormone. So of course, then if you've got low progesterone, you're more likely to be experiencing anxiety, particularly premenstrually in this time where we should be carried through nicely with this anti-anxiety hormone and just not getting enough of it. Um, another really common sign of low progesterone is a prolonged bleed. So we're talking sort of more than seven days. And again, this is related to that maintaining of that lining. Um, and of course, if you're not producing much uh, progesterone, you're also going to be seeing low luteal phase, which is that second half of the cycle temperatures. And that's because like we discussed before, your progesterone increases your body temperature for the second half of the cycle. So if you're not producing that, you will notice that when you're taking your temperatures daily in the morning, you're kind of staying quite low even in that second half of the cycle. And then of course, like we've discussed, low progesterone is often going to mean that you have a lot of those issues and excess symptoms that we discussed before because of that delicate balance. Now, looking at the causes for low progesterone, number one is stress. And the reason for this is because the building blocks that we actually produce progesterone from are the same building blocks that we produce cortisol. So cortisol is our fight and flight response. It's our stress hormone. So when we're chronically stressed, the body is going to prioritize its production of cortisol to help our body deal with the stress. It's not going to be prioritizing progesterone. Um, then of course, the second reason is going to be not ovulating because like we discussed before, if you're not producing that corpus luteum from that little follicle sac where the egg was growing and the egg bursts out and we have that little gland that formed afterwards, of course, you're not going to produce progesterone. That's the only way that we make progesterone naturally. So if you're not ovulating um, or you're on a contraceptive like the pill, which blocks ovulation, you will not be producing progesterone. Okay, the next common hormonal imbalance is high testosterone. So you may have heard of this one before, particularly in a condition called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So the common signs of having this high testosterone, which is our male hormone, things like acne, uh, male pattern hair growth, so you know your upper lip and chin sort of area, um, hair loss on the head, irregular cycles, particularly longer cycles. So you know maybe your period is only coming every two to three months, for example. Um, and this can be a sign of this condition called PCOS, um, which you can chat with your doctor more about if you feel like you might be suffering from. But basically the cause of high testosterone is high insulin. So 
when you've got more insulin floating around your body, which is that hormone we discussed before, which is responsible for moving the glucose out of your blood into the cells, your insulin circulating around everywhere. And what it does is when it gets down to the ovaries, it actually directly stimulates the ovaries to produce more testosterone. So there's a really direct link there with the higher insulin production and the higher testosterone. And the last hormonal imbalance, which is quite linked in with the one we've just discussed, is insulin resistance and blood sugar imbalance. So remember that insulin, like we just touched on, is responsible for moving the glucose into the cells. So when we're chronically indulging on high sugar foods, and we've got lots of sugar floating around in our blood, our body is trying really, really hard to get this sugar out of the blood and into storage or into energy production. So to do that, it's producing more and more and more insulin, which is the hormone that's going to move it out of the blood. The problem is that when we're doing this chronically, the body gets a little bit insensitive to the effects of the insulin. So then what happens is we have to produce more and more and more insulin to have the same effect. Now the issue with this is like we discussed, you've then got a whole lot of insulin circulating around your system and it can be stimulating the increased production of testosterone from the ovaries. Also, when you've got this poor blood sugar control going on, you're going to notice things like mood swings. So you're kind of constantly going up and down and you're riding that roller coaster of energy. Um, also PMS, again, is really common, premenstrual sy syndrome. Brain fog and poor concentrations, you know, changes in your energy are really, really common. And that sugar craving, you know, the 3 p.m. crash where you're like, I just have to get that chocolate bar. Um, a really common sign as well is feeling sleepy after you eat. So you should actually feel really energized after you eat a meal. If you're feeling like your energy really dipped off as soon as you've eaten, that can be a sign that your body's not handling that glucose very well. Another common sign is really stubborn abdominal fat. Um, putting it on around that area is very common with this insulin resistance picture. And of course, increased testosterone from the ovaries like we've discussed. And then the final thing which is related to that testosterone is the irregular cycles. So basically by overstimulating the ovaries, uh, the insulin can cause irregular cycles. Now the part that you've all been waiting for, what do we actually do about these hormonal imbalances? Let's jump into my top six tips for addressing hormonal imbalances naturally. Number one, you probably saw this one coming, get off this sugar roller coaster. So when we're consuming excess sugar constantly, we're riding that roller coaster of energy. I'm sure you've been there. I have been there many times. You know, you're, you, ha you reach for that sugar, you get that high, you feel great, and then an hour later you crash and you're reaching for something else to bring you back up. So you know, your whole day is kind of looking like this, riding the roller coaster. So like we've already touched on, excess sugar can lead to insulin resistance, which also increases inflammation in the body, and it's just not good news for our period health. So when you've got increased inflammation, you can have impaired ovulation and that increased testosterone production that we talked about. So the way I like to think about this is ditch the refined sugars, but please still enjoy complex starches. It's really, really important for your period health and your overall health that you don't completely cut carbohydrates out of your diet. Carbohydrates are actually really important for maintaining a regular cycle and helping to show your body that you're not in a state of famine so that it can keep ovulating regularly and feel like it's safe. So the way to do this is you're looking at reducing your added sugars. So, you know, cutting out the soft drinks, cutting out the sugar sweetened beverages, thinking about where you're adding sugars to food. So are you adding a couple of teaspoons of sugar to your coffee or tea every day? That's a really simple one to start reducing back. You know, are you adding honey on top of your breakfast, for example? And then of course things like lollies, chocolate, all those things we're reaching for in the afternoons, pastries, cakes. And then a big one of course is alcohol, particularly those mixed drinks. So if you're getting, you know, say a spirit mixed with a glass of lemonade or a Coke, that's a big sugar load combined with the alcohol. So, uh, you know, at bare minimum, trying to reduce down to the lower sugar alcohols is going to be a good option. Okay, number two, and this is very related to number one, balanced blood sugar. So when you've got normal balanced blood sugar, you're going to have that normal insulin response. And like we discussed, having a normal insulin response is really, really key to period health. So the way that we do this is balanced meals. So every time you eat a main meal, I want you to be thinking about good quality fat, good quality protein, and lots of fiber. And I'm going to show you a great image in a minute that's going to illustrate how to actually put this together in practice. 
So like I just touched on, quit the sugar, but don't quit the starch or you may lose your period. I've had a number of clients who are following a you know, low carb or keto diet, trying to be healthy because their male partners are doing really, really well on this diet. And they're just saying to me, why am I not losing any weight? And why has my period disappeared? And the reality is women are very different to men. Uh, we actually have different carbohydrate needs to men. So we need more carbohydrates. There's a little part of your brain called the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus actually has a carbohydrate receptor in it. So not only does it just measure how many calories you're eating throughout the day, it actually needs to know you're eating a certain number of carbohydrates. And if you're not, particularly in some more sensitive women, it can shut down ovulation and you therefore can lose your period. So having a moderate amount of good quality complex carbohydrates, which I'll show you in a minute, is really, really important for period health. So please don't completely cut this out of your diet. Um, also, the importance of carbohydrates is that the starch in carbohydrates feeds the good bacteria in our guts, and that is really, really crucial for estrogen detoxification. Um, my last little tip for blood sugar balance is cinnamon. So this is a great one. I love, love, love cinnamon. What you can be doing is just having one teaspoon a day mixed into your meals, you know, add it to a drink, add it to some food. It actually is a natural blood sugar stabilizer. So this doesn't mean you can keep eating all the sugar that you want, but if you feel like you're having a problem with metabolizing your sugars properly and keeping that insulin stable, um, adding a little bit of a sprinkle of cinnamon to your meals is going to help. All right, let's look at how to actually create a balanced plate. So these are the four components that I want you to be thinking about when you're putting together your plate. So number one is protein. Protein is really important, um, you, particularly for blood sugar stabilizing. So on average, if you're thinking about how much protein you might need, you want to be thinking about one gram for every kilogram of body weight you have. So that's a pretty easy calculation to do. So a 60 kilogram woman is going for about 60 grams of protein per day. Now that's grams of protein, not grams of meat. Just make sure you're aware of that one. So how do we get good quality protein? Basically, if you are a meat eater, it's good quality meat, so that's hormone free, you know, it's grass fed where possible, organic where possible. You wanna be putting the best forms of these proteins into your body. Um, fish and seafood are great choices as well. Free range or organic eggs. Beans and lentils are a great vegetarian option, and you can also be getting your protein from nuts and seeds, organic tofu and tempeh as well. Now, one of the most crucial, crucial nutrients that I see so commonly under eaten in women is fat. Um, unfortunately, this is a big hangover from the misinformation we've had the last few decades about the low fat diet being the way to go. Unfortunately, this has caused a huge number of hormonal imbalances in women. The reason for this is because fat provides the building blocks for hormone production. So literally, if we do not have enough fat in our diet, we cannot produce hormones, no matter what else is going on. So having good quality fat at every meal is key. Now when I say good quality fat, I'm talking about avocado, nuts and seeds, tahini, you know, good quality olive oil or olives, and oily fish is a great source of this as well. Um, and then next thing we're looking at starch. So um, things like whole grains, so quinoa, brown rice, buckwheat are good grains to be trying out. You can also be going for your starchy root vegetables as well. So things like sweet potato, even white potato is a better choice than your refined sugars. Um, pumpkin, and then if you wanna be eating pastas, you can be going for your whole grain pastas. And then finally, of course, you want your vegetables on your plate too. So plenty of leafy greens. Leafy greens are one of the most important vegetables for your period health. So, you know, we're talking things like rocket, spinach, kale, collard, green, parsley, whatever you enjoy, go for what you're going to actually enjoy eating. Um, and then of course, all other vegetables are really important as well. Now, I wanna show you a really great image of what a balanced plate actually looks like because it can be a little bit hard to visualize this when I'm talking about it. So here you can see in this image, this is how I want you to be thinking about putting your plate together. So you can see you've got about half your plate is your greens and veggies. So ideally you've got a whole bunch of leafy greens and then you might have a few other things as well that you enjoy. Um, and then you've got about a quarter of your plate is your good carbs. So that's your complex starches that we talked about. And then you can see the good fats is, you know, one to two tablespoons. It's a good portion of that plate, which a lot of people don't realize how much of their plate needs to be fat. Um, now, of course, if you're not having something like avocado, nuts and seeds, or olives or something like that, this can also be in the form of olive oil or another good quality oil. Um, and in that case, you're just doing a really generous drizzle over the top of your meal. And then lastly, you've got about a quarter of your plate. It's that good quality protein as well. And that's going to help keep you full. 
All right, tip number three for naturally balancing your hormones is support hormone detoxification. Now, when we're talking about this, what I mean is initially you're going to produce your hormones, they're moving around your body, they're exerting the effect in the tissues that they need. But then once they're finished with that, they actually need to be broken down and removed from the body. So the two ways that your body does that is one via the liver and then two via the gut. Now, this is really important because if either of these detoxification pathways aren't working properly, what can happen is these hormones can get reabsorbed and then re-exert their effect in the tissues in the body and add to that overall load of excess. So particularly when we're talking about that estrogen excess, we've got that higher estrogen to progesterone ratio. This can be a matter of simply not breaking down those hormones properly so you're adding to that overall load of what's left in your body. So let's look at liver support firstly. How can we support the liver to be effectively breaking down these hormones, which is the first step of detoxification? So some signs that you need to support your liver and that it's not functioning optimally is sensitivity to strong smells. So this is those people that walk through the perfume aisle in a department store and they're just so overwhelmed by the smell. This is definitely me. Um, the next one is headaches and this can be triggered by a lot of different things but again it can be from you know bright lights, it can be from smells, things like that but you're getting headaches frequently. Um, PMS, so that premenstrual syndrome again is common with the liver issues because what's happening here is that estrogen is just not being cleared in time for your bleed. Um, heavy periods, painful periods, fatigue is a common sign as well. And also just that really high sensitivity to either caffeine or alcohol is really common. So there's people that say, oh, I couldn't drink the coffee after 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. or I'd be up all night or people that just can't handle alcohol well. That's a strong sign that your liver is not working well to break down those chemicals. Okay. So how do we support your liver if you are showing some of these signs that your liver needs a little bit of love? Um, number one is focus on your cruciferous vegetables. So cruciferous vegetables actually contain a compound in them which specifically supports the liver to break down estrogen. So it supports a specific phase in there um, that clears estrogen. So this is one of my favorite uses of food as medicine. So what are cruciferous vegetables? They're that family of vegetables that are cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kale, these sorts of vegetables. So if you want to be supporting your liver, you want to be trying to have at least one or two serves of one of these types of vegetables every day to help with that effective clearance of hormones. Number two is start the day with a teaspoon of apple cider vinegar or the juice of half a lemon in a glass of water. The reason for this is it just kickstarts your digestion, it kickstarts your bile flow and it really helps your liver to get started in the morning and really be breaking down everything and functioning efficiently. Number three um, is enjoy bitter foods. So this is things like rocket, Brussels sprouts, dandelion greens, which can be something you can find at farmer's markets, um, and green tea. So again, these foods stimulate the liver to be effectively excreting hormones and working efficiently. Um, and now number four, this is probably pretty obvious, but reducing the load on the liver. So, you know, this means going for organic where possible, using natural skin and hair products, quitting smoking is a big one, reducing alcohol and keeping coffee minimal. Now, the reason for this is if you are overloading your liver with so many different toxins and chemicals to break down every day, it's going to prioritize those over breaking down your hormones. So what we want to be doing here is removing any barriers to your hormones being broken down. So that might mean cutting down on coffee, reducing alcohol, these types of things so that your liver can really just focus on your main goal at the moment, which is getting back into that hormone balance. All right. So after your hormones get broken down in the liver, your liver sends them through to your gut and your gut needs to be functioning efficiently to actually move all of these broken down hormones out of the body. So if your gut isn't working well, you know, you've got an imbalance of the good and bad bacteria or you've got a lot of inflammation going on in your gut, what tends to happen is this broken down hormone that the liver has broken down actually gets reabsorbed and put back together into the shape that it was originally. So we need to make sure your gut is functioning really, really well so that it can uh, efficiently do that last step of excreting those broken down hormones. So these might be a little bit more obvious, but signs that you need to support your gut are things like regular bloating, abdominal pain or cramping, particularly after you've eaten a meal particularly odorous gas, so that's farting or burping. This is a funny one to talk about, but it's actually a really strong sign of how your gut is functioning. So, you know, it's normal to have gas, but it shouldn't be very strong smelling or very odorous. So when you notice a change from kind of quite neutral smell to a really strong smell, you know, I'm talking like 
I think I need to leave the room for this, um, that type of smell. That is really an indicator to us that your good and bad bugs are not in a good balance there. So you may have a bit of an overgrowth of the less friendly bacteria. Um, then also signs like reflux or heartburn are common um, and regularly having loose stools, diarrhea and or con constipation. And then the last sign is a poor appetite. So you know there's people that just cannot eat until lunchtime. That's the sign that your digestion isn't functioning optimally. So how do we support your gut? Well, firstly, we want to make sure that you are eating really easy to digest and nourishing foods. So, you know, obviously salads and raw vegetables and things like that are really healthy and they contain lots of different nutrients, which are great for us. But in a time when your digestive system is really inflamed, you know, you're having that pattern of loose stools or constipation, what we want to do is remove some of those really fibrous, cold, hard to digest foods for a limited time. Um, you know, we definitely want to add these back in once your gut's working well again. But when you're already very inflamed and you're struggling to digest things, adding a lot of these cold, raw foods, it's going to increase that inflammation that's going on in there. So what you want to be doing is taking out some of those um, salads and smoothies and things that you're having and instead replacing them with really slow cooked, you know, soups and stews, um, slow cooked meats, bone broth, uh, cooked vegetables, casseroles, stews and porridges. These are going to be beautiful, nourishing healing foods for you to have in a small time while you're healing that gut up. Um, Next thing you can look at doing is, you know, we want to make sure we're improving that, that uh, friendly to unfriendly bacteria balance. And so we can do that by enjoying fermented foods. So you can be eating things like cultured, unsweetened yogurt, uh, sauerkraut, miso, kombucha, and kefir are all great sources of friendly bacteria to help support that balance. And then the last thing is to be reducing refined and added sugar intake. So like we talked about before, you want to be minimizing your intake of inflammatory foods like cakes, pastries, chocolates, confectionery and soft drinks. Collagen is something that's definitely worth trying. So collagen is a nutrient that's found in the bones of animals and it's a great nutrient for the gut because it supports gut integrity. It also supports healthy skin, hair and joints. Um, so it's a great overall health tool to be using and basically it comes in a powder form it's very very tasteless and odorless and you can actually add it into hot foods or cold foods so you can literally stir it into a coffee or mix it into your um, porridge in the morning very very easy um, you can be taking a tablespoon of that a day to be helping with that gut healing um, another option is to consider adding a probiotic to your regime. So this is really important that you actually talk to a health practitioner that understands the difference between different strains of probiotics. There are so many different probiotics out there on the market now and each probiotic has been researched for different health effects. So you want to be making sure that you are taking a probiotic which actually is specific to what's going on in your body. So um, if you can't actually see a practitioner to do this, even going into a health food store that has, you know, often they have a naturopath or nutritionist on the floor. So you can have a chat with them, explain what's going on for you and they'll be able to give you a bit of individualized advice to make sure you're replenishing the right bacteria that you should be. Um, and then the last uh, option that you can try for gut support, which is a really, really great soothing one, is something called Slippery Elm Bark Powder. Bit of a funny name, I know, but basically this is a fiber. And the reason I love it is when you've got a lot of inflammation, inflammation and irritation going on in the gut, so you're just feeling really bloated and cranky and you know, not happy in your digestion. Um, slippery Elm Bark Powder, you, know, you just take a teaspoon in a glass of water, you can do that any time of the day. And what it does is it forms a gel-like substance, so it actually coats the lining of your digestive tract. So the reason that is so, so nice and soothing for your gut is that it's basically sticking onto the lining of your gut and protecting it from the acid and other sort of irritating things that are going on in there. So it can be a great thing to use, particularly in situations like heartburn and bloating, just to kind of get you through and give you a bit of symptomatic relief whilst you address what's going on. All right, tip number four for naturally balancing your hormones is manage stress. Now I put the word manage here rather than reduce because I realize that a lot of the time we don't have a lot of control over our schedules or what's going on in our lives. So what I think is really, really key here is changing the way we respond to stress and how we deal with it. So the reason this is so important is because chronic stress increases our production of that hormone we discussed earlier called cortisol. So that's our fight or flight response. And when you've got increased cortisol, you get an imbalanced communication between your brain and your ovaries. 
So this means that it leads to delayed or completely stopped halted ovulation, which then means, of course, we're not producing progesterone. Progesterone, as we discussed, is that hormone that helps us deal with stress. We then cope with stress worse, and we kind of get into this cycle where we've got poor or impaired ability to cope with stress, and we're also producing more of this cortisol in an attempt to manage it. So you can see how this sort of spirals. So how do you deal with stress? The number one thing you can do is learn to say no more. So when you look at your life and think, where in my life am I saying yes to things that I really just want to be saying no to? It can just start really simple. You know, maybe you go to one less social event per week and just prioritize yourself for a night. But start paying attention to where you're showing up for people in your life where you could actually be taking a step back. The next strategy is looking at how you actually cope with stress. So you want to be improving your ability to cope with stress. So some of the key ways that you can improve this is through meditation. This is one of my favorite ways to do this. Um, I use an app called Insight Timer. It's free and it's amazing because it gives you access to thousands of different meditations of different people talking. So you can really find someone that kind of works with you. Um, you know, that may not be for you and that's totally fine. But other ways that you can be working on this is, you know, getting regular massages, going to yoga classes, or even just doing some breathing exercises. So doing some deep belly breathing to help you get out of that fight and flight response and into that more rest and digest state. Um, the next important point with dealing with stress is making sure you're having protein with every meal, particularly breakfast. Now this is because it helps stabilize your blood sugar and stabilize your moods. And when you're feeling more stable and calm throughout the day, you're less likely to respond so uh, strongly to a stress or something that goes wrong in your day. Now the next point is regular exercise. But the key point here is it's something that you enjoy and it's not overly strenuous. So you, if your body does not enjoy it, you do not need to be going to that hit class at 5 a.m. You do not need to be running a marathon. This can be something as simple as going for a half hour walk and really spending that time to connect back to your breath and to connect with yourself. Um, and then the last tip, which I think is really key and a lot of us are forgetting, is spending time outdoors. So actually getting barefoot you know, in the ground, whether that be on the grass or on the sand or in the dirt. But a lot of us spend time, you know, we, we go straight from our homes in our car to our indoor workplace and then we drive home and come back inside. So we're spending so little of our time outside. And being outside, particularly being barefoot on the ground, actually has a really grounding effect for your body. So it can help you kind of connect back inwards to yourself and kind of learn to cope with those stresses that are going on externally in your environment. All right. Tip number five for balancing your hormones is consider supplementing. Now, before I get into this, I just want to say that the first four things that we've gone through are really, really crucial and fundamental to getting your hormones back on track. So, you know, you can think about supplements, but basically if you haven't done the groundwork to get all these food and lifestyle things happening, it's unlikely that these supplements are going to have an effect. So I really encourage you to first work on getting that basic groundwork right before you start bringing in a bunch of supplements. So, you know, um, if you are at that point where you've started to work on all these different things, these are my four supplements that I see really, really great results with for hormone imbalances. So the first supplement that I recommend is magnesium. Now, magnesium is a really great nutrient for helping us cope with stress. So as we talked about, stress has a big influence on the menstrual cycles. This is one way that you can be helping yourself deal with stress. Um, magnesium is also a great nutrient for helping with our sleep. It helps reduce PMS and it also helps reduce period pain because it's a natural muscle relaxant. Now, there's many different forms of magnesium. So if you can, go for the bisglycinate form. This type of magnesium has the least effect on your digestion. So some of the cheaper brands you'll find that they can cause diarrhea. This one won't have any effect on your digestion. And you want to be going for about 300 milligrams a day. Now, my second nutrient that I recommend is zinc. So zinc nourishes the ovarian follicles to promote healthy ovulation and progesterone production. So it's also great for the gut lining. It helps sort of heal up any damages going on in the gut. It also helps to block excess testosterone. So it's great if you're experiencing things like acne or that male pattern hair growth. Um, the other key point here is if you're vegan or vegetarian, it's likely that you're deficient in zinc because one of the main ways that we get zinc in our diet is through animal sources. 
So if you're going to supplement zinc, I'd recommend around 30 milligrams a day in either the citrate or picolinate form. And you want to be taking this after food. This is really important because if you take zinc on an empty, empty stomach, it can cause nausea. If you take it after food, you'll be completely fine. Now the third one is iodine. And the important point here with iodine is you want to make sure you've already been checked for something called thyroid antibodies. So this is a really simple test that you can ask your doctor to check for you. You just want to make sure that you haven't got raised antibodies, which can mean that you are more likely to, to develop a thyroid disorder. In that case, you don't want to be supplementing too much iodine in case you sort of trigger something there. But if you've had that test done and you're all clear, you'll be totally safe to supplement iodine. Now iodine is one of the best treatments for estrogen excess. So that's things like your breast pain, you know, ovulation pain, if you've got things like ovarian cysts, PMS. The reason for this is because it helps with the metabolism of estrogen and it also makes the cells less sensitive to estrogen. So if you've had those antibodies checked, you can be safely supplementing about 300 micrograms a day. It usually comes in a little dropper bottle, so it's quite easy to just add that to a glass of water. And then the fourth supplement that I recommend is iron. So iron is actually one of the most common causes for heavy periods. This is kind of a funny kind of productive thing, but sometimes when your body is low in iron, it actually um, sheds more of that lining, which then of course means that you become more deficient in iron because you're releasing that through your menstrual blood. So if you ha are having any signs of low iron, so that might be on a blood test if you've had that checked by your doctor, um, or if you've got symptoms of fatigue or shortness of breath, there can be signs that you might have iodine de iron deficiency. Um, you want to be supplementing about 24 milligrams a day. You want to be having that away from caffeine because caffeine blocks the absorption of iron. And it's actually best to supplement every second day. So they've found out through the research now that you, your body actually will absorb more if you supplement every second day so it becomes less reliant. Okay, and my final tip for natural hormone balance is to tune into the subtle energies throughout your cycle. So a lot of women are not aware of this, but the way that our cycles function are very different to men. So men function on roughly a 24 hour cycle. So first thing in the morning, their testosterone is at its highest, they're really productive, they're getting lots done, and throughout the day, this just kind of slowly dips off. You know, they get less productive, they get more tired, then they go to sleep, they re rejuvenate overnight. And then in the morning, they're ready to go again. So they're kind of just working on this day-to-day -day cycle. Whereas women, we work on a month-long cycle or however long our menstrual cycle is. So this means that we're not designed to be super productive and energetic every single day of the month. So the unfortunate point about this is that our workforce is really developed around this masculine energy of you know, high productivity every single day. Whereas women actually don't function very well like that. So we are actually designed to rest and slow down a menstruation. So this is meant to be a time where we're looking after ourselves, we're really you know, amping up our self-care habits and disconnecting from the world a little bit. And then around the time of ovulation, which is around that mid-cycle time, is when we're highest energy, we're most productive, you know, we're making big decisions, we're getting lots of new projects and things started, and we're feeling really, really great and in the flow. When you start to pay attention to these different rhythms throughout the menstrual cycle, you can really start to tap into the power of each of these different types of energy. So if you take the time around menstruation to rest, I guarantee you, you will be so much more productive and have such higher energy for the rest of your menstrual cycle. So I know that this can be a really conflicting idea when we're kind of brought up in this culture where we need to just be go, go, go all the time, always producing. But if you take that time to slow down and connect back in with yourself, even just for one day around menstruation, you will notice a profound difference in your energy for the rest of the cycle. So what does this look like when I'm talking about, you know, slowing down and making time for yourself? Well, you know, if you're lucky enough that you can have a bit of flexibility at work and there are a lot of workplaces now that are becoming a little bit more progressive around this sort of menstrual cycle awareness, then, you know, maybe you can take a work from home day. If you're not that lucky with your workplace, maybe it's, you know, finishing half an hour early or saying no to some event that you had on that you don't really want to go to and actually just going home taking a bath, sitting on the couch, reading a book with a cup of tea, and just giving yourself one hour of quiet time. Even just taking that one hour per month is gonna have a massive difference in the rest of your cycle. 
Um, then the other way that we can really tap into this energy is for uh, for that mid cycle where we've really got that great productivity, that great energy and focus to be using that as a time in our calendars to be scheduling big events. So you know you're scheduling things like meetings, big presentations, and even big life decisions. If you could do that around the mid cycle, you're going to have a lot more energy and focus. I really, really encourage you to try this. You know, maybe um, it's as simple as starting a journal where you're just recording what your energy is like every day. Start to just tap into these different energies which you will notice shifting throughout the cycle. And if you can clear some space around menstruation, that is going to make a massive, massive difference to the rest of your cycle. So there you have it, my top six tips for hormone balance. If you're interested in getting further into what's causing your hormone issues or period problems, we take a deep dive into all of the different hormone conditions and what to do about them in my 12-week e-course. In the meantime, I would love to connect with you. Let me know what you thought of the content, if you've got any questions, or if you've tried any of the suggestions that we chatted about today over on one of the channels here. Speak to you soon.